Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm sure it's uh, tea time and everybody would be wanting to go for tea. But since we have been allotted this time, we need to go ahead. And we are right on time. So we'll start this instruction course of ours, instruction course number 410, with the topic of orbital inflammations and infections, efforts to thaw the impending threat to sight and life. So we have all, all our speakers sitting here, thankfully. And uh, I'll just uh, introduce you. The first talk is by Dr. Bhavna Kurana. I'll request her to come on the dais. She's going to speak on orbital inflammatory diseases at Pandora's box. After this, uh, Dr. Sahil somehow has not been able to come, but his talk is with us and I'll be presenting that. After that, uh, Dr. Neelam Pushkar, ma'am, from RP Center Ames. Ma'am, I request you to please come forward and sit on the dais. She's going to present on orbital aspergillosis, a decade experience with boriconazole. After that, Dr. Rachna is going to... After that, there's my talk, Rhino Orbital Cerebral Mucomycosis. Then Dr. Rachna, she's just coming. She had a poster to present. And Dr. Rolly Sood is with us from Karnal. She's associate professor over there. She's going to speak on atypical aggressive orbital infection. Dr. Rolly, please come on the dais. And we have with us uh, Dr. Seema Kashyap, ma'am, from RP Center Ames, ocular pathologist. She's going to speak on orbital inflammations, victory domain of pathologists. And ma'am, I request you to please come over. Ma'am, please, I... Uh, I hope you all will find this session informative and uh, you are welcome to ask any questions at the end and we'll just begin with it. I request Dr. Bhavna to start her first talk, Orbital Inflammatory Diseases of Pandora's Box. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'll be presenting an overview of the orbital inflammatory <laughs> disorders. Uh, so orbital inflammatory disorders are all disorders that affect some or all of the structures contained within the orbit external to the ocular globe may extend beyond the orbit into the cavernous sinus through the orbital apex and importantly need to be differentiated from neoplastic and infectious diseases that may have a similar presentation. A brief classification, idiopathic inflammatory diseases, neoplastic, congenital malformations, infectious and systemic inflammatory diseases. Uh, most common clinical uh, features could be pain, which is a prominent complaint. If involvement of extraocular muscles, they can be diplopia. Lacrimal gland involvement can lead to a painful supralateral orbital swelling. Generalized orbital tissue involvement can lead to proptosis, chemosis, periorbital swelling and even blindness in severe cases due to optic nerve compression. The onset can be acute to insidious or subacute. Orbital congestion from a rapidly growing tumor may also mimic orbital cellulitis and tumor necrosis and this may provoke an inflammatory reaction. Coming to some of the specific diseases, a brief overview of thyroid associated ophthalmopathy which is the most common cause of orbital inflammation in adults accounting for nearly 60% of cases. Uh, mean age of onset is around 40 years, more common in women and smoking appears to be a significant factor for both increase and severity of the thyroid ophthalmopathy. The pathophysiology is autoimmune mediated process uh, again uh, with marked infiltration of lymphocytes and macrophages which leads to a swelling of the extraocular muscles which spares the tenderness insertion of the muscles. This is an important differentiation from the idiopathic orbital inflammation that shows even more extensive lymphocytic infiltration so it includes the tenderness insertions also. Uh, clinical features, thyroid ophthalmopathy presents with the clinical, uh, typical clinical features like in this patient there is a lid lag or lag of thalmos, bilateral lid retraction. Uh, diagnosis is with the help of a complete thyroid profile and MRI uh, being more sensitive for TAO than CT where we see the characteristic enlargement of the extraocular muscles. Uh, so uh, they appear uh, to have a characteristic spindle shape as can be seen in this picture. Uh, for small, uh, for uh, early cases of TAO with a small deviation, we can prescribe prisons. Uh, we have to manage the dry eye and the corneal exposure, if any. Uh, depending on the classification and the UGOGO and the visa staging, we can start systemic steroids for severe inflammation and cases with compressive optic neuropathy. Uh, in severe cases, a combined therapy of steroid radiation and surgery may be considered. Immunotherapy in the form of rituximab, cyclosporin, octreotide, IVIG are relatively less common modality of uh, treatment but reserved for resistant cases. Uh, orbital inflammatory disease or pseudotumor or IOID is the third most common orbital disease uh, causing inflammation after Graves' orbitopathy and lymphoproliferative diseases. The common sites for uh, uh, IOID are the lacrimal glands, the extraocular muscles, uh, perineuritis of the optic nerve, orbital cellulitis, orbital apicitis, also known as Tolosa-Hunt syndrome, periscleritis or diffuse orbital inflammatory disease. Uh, 
Uh, coming to a brief about dacryo adenitis, it presents as a painful firm erythematous mass in the lateral upper lid and there may be proptosis also. Uh, there is a diffuse enlargement of the gland which might include both the orbital and the palpebral lobe along with inflammation of the surrounding tissues also. Uh, this is a picture of uh, dacryo adenitis where the T2 section shows diffuse enlargement of the left lacrimal gland. Myositis is a non-infectious inflammatory condition affecting the extraocular muscles presenting with mostly unilateral orbital or periorbital pain, painful and restricted extraocular muscles, proptosis, edema and hyperemia of the conjunctiva. Important differentials for myositis include TAO, IgG4 related disease, lymphoma and carotid cavernous fistulas. This is a picture which is showing the involvement of the superior and medial rectus, the myositis. Cellulitis is inflammation of the preceptal or the postceptal fat. Patients typically present with proptosis, chemosis and painful diplopia. Best evaluated on contrast enhanced T1 MRI. Infectious cellulitis shares similar imaging features so important to obtain any clinical history of fever, sinusitis, meningitis as well as any blood picture of leukocytosis. So this is a picture showing a diffuse cellulitic or vital inflammatory response. Uh, optic perineuritis is intraorbital inflammation that extends along the optic nerve and the nerve sheath. Uh, because inflammation is affecting the nerve sheath rather than the nerve itself, then the primary presenting features are mostly pain, while vision, visual fields and color visions are typically unaffected. So the differential, like important differentials for optic perineuritis are meningioma and demyelinating lesions. Meningioma can be differentiated on the basis of a CT scan. So this is a picture of a perineuritic orbital inflammatory disease and this is how we differentiate from the meningioma of the right optic nerve sheath. Uh, idiopathic uh, orbital inflammation sometimes may present as a focal mass, as a focal inflammatory mass and nine, almost 9% 9 of cases can present in that way. Uh, so it presents a dilated edema or uh, if it is more extensive, there can be an optic nerve atrophy uh, to be differentiated from lymphomatous lesions which present more commonly as a palpable mass. So this is an orbital inflammatory disease which is producing a focal mass effect. Orbital apicitis is involvement of the orbital apex. It is relatively less common and associated with poorer outcome because there is a risk of invading the optic nerve early and also the cavernous sinus. In, uh, if it invades the cavernous sinus, it is known as an entity called Tolosa Hunt syndrome characterized by cavernous sinus inflammation, relapsing, remitting acute orbital pain and paralysis of the cranial nerves, third, fourth, v, fifth, uh, first branch and the sixth nerve. Uh, typical features of Tolosa Hunt syndrome uh, are uh, diplopia, visual loss, paresthesias along the forehead and uh, a unilateral involvement. The criteria for Tolosa Hunt syndrome diagnosis includes episodes of unilateral orbital pain for an average of 8 weeks, associated paresis of the cranial nerves, pain that is relieved within 72 hours of steroid therapy and exclusion of any other similar conditions by neuroimaging and angiography. Uh, first line of treatment is corticosteroid followed by uh, immunosuppressive treatment in the form of meth methotrexate and azathioprine in the non-responsive cases. In spite of treatment, relapse has been seen in about 40% cases. So, uh, coming to a brief about IgG4 related diseases, it was first described in a patient with autoimmune pancreatitis who had high serum IgG4 levels. Uh, it is considered as a multi-system disorder which involves the pancreas, the biliary tree, the salivary glands, the kidney, lungs, uh, skin and prostate. So, there is a multi-systemic involvement. Uh, there could be a hypertrophic pachymeningitis and hypophysitis if the CNS involvement is there. In orbits, more commonly the lacrimal glands are involved, followed by the extraocular muscles, followed by the adipose tissue. Clinical features are a painless unilateral or sometimes bilateral periorbital swelling and erythema due to lac if the lacrimal gland involvement is there in the suprolateral quadrant. Uh, compressive optic neuropathy is relatively less common and there might be an associated salivary gland enlargement. So, diagnostic criteria is based on the imaging studies which show enlargement of the lacrimal gland or the, uh, the extraocular muscles or they could be a mass effect or enlargement of hypertrophic lesions in the various ophthalmic tissues. Uh, confirmation is by a histopathological uh, confirmation. Uh, blood test is helpful in adding to the diagnosis where we see an elevated serum IgG4 level. First line of treatment is again corticosteroid with which the relapse rate has been reported to be as high as 70%. Treatment of relapse involves 6 to 10 weeks of steroid or rituximab. Relapse is also, can also be seen with rituximab after 6 months. 
uh, sarcoidosis is another cause of, of uh, orbital inflammation it is an idiopathic multi system inflammatory disorder uh, ophthalmic disease is seen in about 25 to 50% of patients among which even anterior and posterior uveitis could be there sarcoid infiltration of orbit is relatively less common and present only in 25% of the cases with ocular involvement and in 10% of all total patients of sarcoidosis generally orbital in, uh, involvement in sarcoidosis is limited to the lacrimal glands presentation is uh, similar as the idiopathic inflammatory disorders with pain of thalmoplegia proptosis and later in extensive cases there may be diminished vision symptoms characteristically uh, tend to wax and wane and there might be spontaneous remissions also uh, ace levels are a useful uh, useful for the diagnosis but it doesn't help uh, if the pulmonary involvement is not there uh, the other sensitive uh, investigation is chest ct scan uh there might be uh, an uh, orbital inflammation might be caused by vasculitis also uh in the form of a chirk strauss disease polyarthritis nodosa gca wegener's granulomatosis this has a special predilection for orbital tissue and ophthalmic disease affects about uh, 20 to 50% of patients at some point in the course of wegener granulomatosis and it might be the initial presentation in about 8 to 16% of cases so uh So uh, this is a brief about uh, the orbital inflammatory disorders and their typical radiological findings. A few rare causes of uh, orbital inflammation are uh, xanthogranulomatous disease, adult onset xanthogranuloma, Erdheim-Chester disease, Castleman's disease, Kimura's disease, and angio lymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia, Rosai-Doffman disease, to name a few. And we need a biopsy and a histopathological diagnosis to confirm them. Thank you. thank you bhavna for giving an overview about all the orbital inflammatory diseases and uh, that, that finishing it on time also i request dr rachna ma'am to kindly come and join on the panel please aaja aaja uh, and this we'll proceed with the next talk the next talk is uh, supposed supposed to be by dr sahil agarwal from rp center due to certain reasons in the last minute he couldn't come so i'll be presenting his talk uh the topic is bacterial orbital infections challenges and perspectives uh, this i have no financial disclosure to be made as you know bacterial infections it can be a preseptal involvement which is more common in less than 5 years and postseptal involvement in more than 5 years old children commonly it is associated with sinusitis and most common would be ethmoid sinusitis males are more affected than females and we can classify them as preseptal cellulitis orbital cellulitis subperiosteal abscess cavernous sinus thrombosis necrotizing fasciitis or gas gangrene so we'll take up one by one the chandler staging of orbital infections grades it into periorbital uh, or preseptal cell Cellulitis, orbital cellulitis, subperiosteal abscess, orbital abscess, or the cavernous sinus thrombophlebitis. Coming to the preseptal cellulitis, it is infection of subcutaneous tissue anterior to the orbital septum. The organism responsible mainly are Staph aureus and Streptopyogenes. History is important as fever, URI, sinusitis, NLDO, and trauma are more commonly found. The lids may be swollen and tender. Generally, we don't find proptosis or chemosis. Vision is found to be normal, and pupillary reaction and ocular motility are also found to be normal when it's a preseptal cellulitis. as we progress it progresses further it can go further to orbital cellulitis or the patient may per se present as orbital cellulitis in which the inflammation of the soft tissues of the orbit posterior to the orbital septum takes place systemic symptoms will be more common fever malaise lid edema and of many and often protrusion of eye to the extent of extensive proptosis limitation of eye movements which may be painful and visual impairment may also be there and how does it happen the infection can spread from periorbital structures to the paranasal sinuses infection of the lacrimal sac can lead to orbital cellulitis dental infection or any skin infection of face and eyelid which is non attended when for persisting for a long time may go on into orbital cellulitis there may be endogenous causes like bacteremia with septic embolization patients of organ transplant or immunosuppressed patients exogenous causes may be trauma due to any foreign infective foreign body generally or it can be surgical also hydrogenic or intraorbital causes may be there which could be end of or dacroidinitis 
Roots of infection generally, as we see, sinuses are most commonly involved. The orbit, as you know, is surrounded by sinuses, most commonly the maxillary antrum. As you can see, sometimes when the sinuses get infected, the cilia dependent drainage of sinuses decreases due to this accumul accumulation of purulent material within the sinuses occurs. And this purulent material can gain access to the orbit to the porous bony walls and can then further lead to orbital cellulitis. There are various veins traversing, and the infection can traverse through these veins into the periorbital space or in the orbital cavity. So, in such a case, history taking becomes very important. Find out if there is any history of trauma, which generally the patient gives on his own. Any surgery or dental procedure done during few uh, in the past uh, period, or any systemic infection that can have an hematogenous spread if the patient is immunocompromised, has been hospitalized for a long time, any nasal or ear discharge is there, a severe headache persistent has been there, or any other ocular complaints have been there. So, be particular about taking the history. The clinical examination uh, take care of the general because such patients are generally toxic. So, we need to give. Uh, uh, care of the entire thing system and systemic examination for sinusitis, respiratory infection, otitis or facial infection. Ocular examination will include uh, definitely the if any lacrimal uh, sac area should be checked, then if there is any sty or any periorbital infection involvement of the lids is there, eyeball or extraocular movement and proptosis should be checked. Check the conjunctiva for congestion. Normally, chemosis is commonly present in orbital cellulitis. Cornea due to proptosis and due to chemosis and other things may and lag of thelmos result due to the extensive pressure may be going into exposure keratopathy and fundus may also, also show papilledema CRAO or CRVO. Investigations would be, uh, since the patients are toxic, I told you, so we need to go for the systemic investigations of CBC, LFT, RFT, these things should be taken, sugar always should be checked, diaptic status, smear for bacterial and fungal stains should be done and wherever needed cultures should be sent, radiological imaging is important in such cases to know the extent and where the disease has spread up to or any other clue you may get from imaging which you might have been missing clinically and cultures from discharge or abscess and urine routine and culture sensitivity activity are the important findings to be done. How would you manage orbital cellulitis? Systemic stability, try to bring that parental and topical antibiotics in the form of septriaxone, vancomycin, metronidazole commonly used to cover the gram negatives beside linezolate is also common nowadays. Nasal decongestant and nasal irrigation for concurrent sinusitis. Steroids are controversial and monitoring response to therapy as well as systemic side effects of therapy is a must. Now, coming to, these were the common thing, preceptal and orbital, we generally, as residents also, they come across so many times. Then there are certain things which are as present as challenges, one of them being subperiosteal sub abscess, clinically sometimes may be missed. So, you have to see, and it is most common along the medial wall, if orbital cellulitis is not treated, it may present with pain, proptosis, it may lead to subperiosteal abscess, and that presents with pain, proptosis, chemosis, vision loss, and loss of ocular movements. Management is drainage of abscess and IV antibiotics. So, these are the pictures of patients of uh, the periosteal abscess. When to intervene in such cases? If in any of these findings, if they according to this Garcia and Harris criteria, acute optic nerve or retinal compromise is visible, large subperiosteal abscess is there, non-medial location of the subperiosteal abscess is there, presence of frontal sinusitis, suspicion of anaerobic infection if you find emphys uh, emphysematous area in the abscess area, infection of known dental origin, evidence of chronic sinusitis is there, patient is 9 years or older or recurrence of this after previous drainage occurs again. So, that is the time when you need to intervene. Another challenge is cavernous sinus thrombosis. It includes cases of phlebitis, thrombophlebitis and phlebothrombosis and aseptic thrombosis. Most cases are of septic origin. Aseptic types may follow head trauma, neurosurgical procedures and local stasis or a failing circulation and it often follows a subacute course and later becomes chronic. And clinically you see ocular pain, vision is lost, sometimes decreased vision, lacrimation, photophobia, chemosis, lid edema, proptosis, ophthalmoplegia is sometimes the presenting finding also, sluggish pupillary reaction, red retinal venous engorgement and disc edema and retinal edema. All these clinical features in one way or the other or multiple of them may be present. And complications of cavernous sinus thrombosis may be meningitis if not treated, not taken care of, can lead to meningitis, sepsis and shock, permanent loss of vision, cranial nerve palsies and septic emboli. And we need to go for this also for the complete blood investigations, blood culture, CSF examination. Imaging is must, especially the CT and CMRI brain and orbit, carotid angiography and orbital venography wherever indicated. 
Intervention should be early and aggressive in the form of antibiotic first. The primary source of infection should be drained wherever you are. You, and it has to be a multidisciplinary approach. At, at times, you have to take help from the ENT, from the medicine, and together you have to go ahead with it. In septic thrombosis, the internal jugular vein may be ligated to prevent spread of infection. Anticoagulation with heparin to prevent further thrombosis and corticosteroid to reduce inflammation and edema may be used as adjunctive therapy. Few other rare find, uh, problems can be orbital tuberculosis. Mycobacterium hominis or atypical mycobacteria is commonly seen to be leading to it. It may involve eyelids, lacrimal gland, orbital soft tissues, periosteum or bony walls. Absence of pulmonary involvement does not rule out granulomatous orbital infection. So keep this clue in your mind. Direct extension of the tuberculoma may occur into the adjacent paranasal sinus or the intracranial cavity. So it has to be attended as a challenging case and not left to spread. Clinically, it may present as a cold abscess of the orbit, discharging cutaneous sinus or rarely optic neuritis secondary to sphenoidal osteomyelitis. Diagnosis can be by uh, blood investigations, MON2, chest x-ray, culture of aspirate and CECT of orbit. And as for every case of tuberculosis, start with ATT, be in touch with the teams and may require abscess drainage at times. Lastly, we have gas gangrene, which may be due to clostridial myonecrosis or gas gangrene, which is a devastating process. It is commonly caused by clostridium perfringens. It is rare, but usually occurs in the devitalized tissues. It may be managed by debridement, appropriate antibiotic therapy and hyperbaric oxygen. Perspective of oral corticosteroids being given in orbital surgery. This was a uh, uh, paper presented by Neelam Pushkar Mam et al. Role of oral corticosteroids in orbital cellulitis. And the conclusion it said was that timely use of we generally teach our residents that in infective cases we should avoid steroids. But uh, it, a balanced approach definitely helps. So the conclusion was that timely use of steroids probably helps in controlling the inflammation, hence reducing the neurological sequelae. It decreases the need for surgical drainage and intravenous antibiotics in patients giving, given steroids and it decreases the hospital course of stay also. So under experienced hands, if you go ahead with the um, uh, cover of a good antibiotics and you have to give steroids, it is not absolutely a contraindication. To conclude, morbidity and mortality have decreased over the past decades due to uh, this uh, say orbital cellulitis and other uh, orbital inflammations. However, cellulitis still may lead to serious ophthalmic neurological sequelae and death. Early diagnosis and management are crucial for the preservation of vision and diminution of complications. Comprehension of clinical management manifestations, predisposing factors, microbiology and management of the disease is necessary. A multidisciplinary approach is indispensable for responsible monitoring and management of the disease. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. Thank you Dr. Rudmil for covering the topic so wonderfully. So I think in orbital inflammation it's very important to have a you know good history taking because uh, we all know that most of the inflammation, orbital inflammation, they are bacterial in nature. If it, there is a short history, say in just few days, a uh, patient comes to you with uh, almost no investigation, one should consider, you know, uh, empirical intravenous antibiotic treatment and as soon as possible, one should try to get the imaging done so that we know what exactly we are dealing with. So signs of orbital inflammation, if it's there, then there is no harm uh, putting patient on uh, empirical antibiotic and uh, at the same time, you know, do the investigation and look for the cause. So history taking is very important. Acute presentation, generally bacterial, we all know if there is a subacute sub kind of presentation, maybe it is idiopathic orbital inflammatory disease or maybe it is IgG4. And if it's a chronic kind of inflammatory, we know that maybe it is tuberculosis or fungal. So I think history taking is a very important part plus obviously then you know the imaging will guide us in managing the condition. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Can I add yeah, just yeah, one please. before we go on to the next speaker is yeah, about please. the retinoblastoma patients presenting with orbital cellulitis yes, also please. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. Well, that is something yeah, that, that is. we should all know that retinoblastoma patients can sometime present with an acute orbital cellulitis and you should always do an ultrasound for uh, intraocular tumor in a child who presents to you with orbital cellulitis. It might just be a retinoblastoma presenting with an aseptic orbital cellulitis. Because generally the bacterial cellulitis we see in children, young children and you know young adults so that is very important point. Thank you Rashi. Thank you, ma'am. And may I now request Dr. Neelam Pushkar, ma'am, only. Uh, she is professor of ophthalmology and a very renowned oculoplastic surgeon at RP Center of Thalmic Sciences. And I request her to speak on orbital aspergillosis, a decade experience with Voriconazole. Good afternoon, everyone. So, 
Uh, today I'll be sharing my uh, a decade uh, long experience with voriconazole in treatment of invasive aspergillosis of the orbit. So we all know that fungal infections of the orbit, they come from the sinuses, the orbital cavity is surrounded on three sides by the sinuses. And, uh, but there can be other causes also like trauma or hematogenous uh, cause can be there and the organisms are mostly uh, aspergillus and rhizopus. So my topic today I'll be covering is the aspergillus infection. So it is potentially fatal if left untreated. And uh, the commonest form of aspergillus infection that we see in the orbit is invasive aspergillosis, unlike allergic rhinitis and aspergilloma, which we see in the respiratory system. Uh, concomitant sinus disease is found in around uh, 60 to 90 percent patients. And uh, but the uh, type of patients we see, they are usually limited uh, sinoorbital or orbital invasive aspergillosis. And uh, over, say, two uh, decades of my experience, I have seen these patients mostly in immunocompetent patients, uh, young to middle age, uh, presenting with invasive aspergillosis. Though there are other risk factors also, like immunocompromised status or uh, steroid or any, you know, uh, kidney disease. Sorry. So the clinical presentation of invasive aspergillosis uh, is uh, usually, you know, it's a, a uh, it's a very silent, uh, si uh, there is hardly any inflammatory signs and uh, if it is there, it's uh, of mild degree and uh, they have a like a chronic course and usually they present with unilateral uh, proptosis and uh, there will be some extraocular motility restriction, some uh, inflammatory signs, vision loss will not be as bad as we see in mucormycosis and generally it is seen around 50% of the uh, patients. And of course, associated sinusitis also we see, but there are, uh, you know, um, uh, cases of purely orbital uh, uh, involvement also, which uh, uh, I have come across. So this is how uh, the patient usually present uh, young to middle age, you know, with quiet eye with proptosis. And when you get the imaging done, you will see the sinuses, they are filled. Uh, and I'll come to the details of the imaging findings. So, but unlike in adults, uh, very rarely uh, uh, we have also seen in infants uh, with invasive aspergillosis. And if you compare with the previous adult picture, you will see that it has very fulminant look. And uh, generally they are associated, you know, signs of inflammation. And if you palpate, you will find, you know, the lesions are really very hard all around in the orbit. Unlike uh, as you see in a case with uh, bacterial cellulitis. So one can confuse that maybe this is bacterial cellulitis, but if you palpate, you will feel that it's uh, really hard, harder than induration, I must say, and they will not respond to your intravenous, you know, antibiotics. So this was a uh, case, two cases uh, we had reported, and this is one of the uh, case uh, uh, infant uh, where there was, uh, you know, on FNAC only we. Uh, diagnose this as uh, invasive uh, aspergillosis and you can see that uh, only FNAC was done. This was immunocompetent baby, no sinuses involvement. So this is something which is difficult to explain, uh, but this is how it is. So and after six weeks uh, of intravenous uh, liposomal amphotericin B, you can see the response. So the, the response is usually, uh, you know, extremely good just by giving antifungals timely. So uh, coming to the investigations, what we see on investigation, CT is the uh, modality of choice. Uh, what we see is, you know, ill-defined. That is very important, ill-defined and hyperdense lesion, which can involve uh, orbit, sinuses, maybe some other, you know, cavity, surrounding cavities. And bony erosion or defect is seen in majority of cases. And in immunocompetent patients, uh, as I'm talking about the localized one, the organism, the species is the aspergillus uh, flavors. And in the immunocompromised patient, generally it is the aspergillus fumigators. And uh, because as I said, the presentation is like, a, you know, uh, in months there is history of proptosis. So generally we land up doing a, a biopsy and uh, the diagnosis is generally on the basis of biopsy. Uh, where we see uh, the septate hyphae, 45 degrees angle, dichotomous branching, these are very specific, you know, pointers towards uh, this being aspergillus uh, uh, infection, along, obviously along with the granulomatous uh, inflammation you will see. 
Then the role of biomarker, we know that for systemic invasive aspergillosis, it's the serum galactomenin, which really helps in, you know, in even initiating the treatment in patients where you are not able to do a biopsy or take a sample. But if serum galactomenin is raised, the treat patient is started on, you know, uh, antifungal treatment just on the basis of that. So I'll come to a study which was done even in the, uh, you know, uh, sinoorbital disease. This is just to show the silver methamine uh, staining. Uh, you can see the dichotomous uh, arrangement of the uh, filaments. And um, this is the fungal culture showing the yellowish green uh, uh, color colony. The, uh, this is of aspergillus flavors. So uh, I'll come to the voriconazole since voriconazole almost it's been no, more than a decade that it has become standard of care for systemic invasive aspergillosis and even for the you know sinoorbital uh, uh, diseases. So uh, I'll come to the results my own uh, the studies which uh, were conducted in our center. So as such uh, uh, there are no guidelines regarding the duration of treatment. And uh, uh, serum galactomenin, uh, uh, one study which we conducted, after that at least I have started doing uh, serum galactomenin in all our uh, patients, the reason I will come to. Um, and uh, uh, the response to oriconazole according to uh, our experience is around 80 to 90 percent patient they respond well. And uh, generally, there is no need to do any sinus, uh, you know, debridement or any mutilating kind of surgeries. So, excentration as uh, uh, before it was, you know, considered even in the apical cases, uh, you can, you know, uh, just give voriconazole, it really, really works. So, uh, now it's for past, I think, uh, 15 years or so, I am not doing any excentration, not even orbital debridement in these patients. Biopsy generally is done by ENT people. If suppose they are not able to get the report pro properly or get the biopsy, then sometimes we do by orbital approach. But orbit, there is no need to really touch. So, this is like one of the uh, patients, uh, you can see the sinuses, ethmoid sinuses, they are the you know, commonest uh, sinus to get involved and see after three months uh, after debridement, the, even the orbital disease and the proptosis, everything has, uh, you know, become almost normal. This is another patient where the uh, predominantly orbital component was there and mi minimal sinus uh, involvement was there. And you can see the proptosis which resolved at three months uh, follow up. Some residual, you know, uh, uh, scarred uh, uh, part of the thing will uh, will probably you see on imaging, but that doesn't always mean that you will have hundred percent. You know the uh, uh, the thing will go away. It's not like that. The, that part of the uh, orbital tissue which we see on CT sometimes we feel that it's because of the uh, some uh, remaining fungal in infection, but it's not like that. You know that that is just some fibrotic, some you know soft tissue changes because uh, there was infection there. So this was the first uh, publication when I had joined. This was a uh, you know ten years uh, retrospective study where we took the data from the uh, pathology uh, department. That time intravenous amphotericin B was the uh, you know line of treatment followed. Only two patients in this series uh, were given voriconazole. This is just I wanted to you know. Uh, over the past two decades, I want to show, uh, you know, one, two um, studies which we conducted and what were the, you know, uh, uh, treatment outcome. So in this patient, if you see uh, one patient died and six patients underwent orbital uh, uh, surgery and three had, you know, destructive procedure. Uh, median follow up was uh, uh, 20 months in this study. So this was uh, uh, the data from uh, 1999 to 2009. Then this was another study which uh, was conducted uh, uh, between 2012 and 2013. Uh, in, in this, uh, uh, we basically studied the role of voriconazole because this was the time when voriconazole was used even for the systemic, uh, you know, uh, invasive aspergillus infection. So in this, uh, 10 patients were recruited. We all know it's a rare, you know, disease and uh, uh, rarely we come to see these patients. So 10 patients were uh, included, 9 were immunocompetent and all patients grew aspergillus flavors and 90% patient, they had good response to voriconazole. None of the patients, they require any orbital debridement or any destructive uh, procedure, though sinus surgery was required in most of the patients and there was no recurrence with the mean uh, follow-up 
of 5.8 months which is a little you know short uh, follow up but uh, yes that was the result and uh, this was the uh, patient from okay I, another just uh, you know two minutes so this patient you can see the response at three months this is another patient so treatment protocol is very much standard we use intravenous for two to three weeks followed by oral voriconazole if patient is not able to afford oral voriconazole then one can even start itroconazole that also really works well and this was a study which was uh, conducted between 2017 and 2018 and this was on correlation of serum galactomannan antigen and uh, we correlated this with the response to voriconazole 12 patients were included and 5 patients had positive GMI GMI is galactomannan index and when we compared this with the response uh, to treatment we found that there was significant decline of uh, galactomannan levels depending on the response which was which correlated absolutely correlated with the uh, clinical response from day 7 onwards the sensitivity was low because we know that it's a localized disease and uh, but the specificity was 100% controls were included in this uh, particular study so galactomannan uh, we all know it's a hetero polysaccharide cell wall component released by growing hyphae of aspergillus so whenever you feel uh, like uh, when to stop or when to start again uh, serum galactomannan uh, uh, should be advised that is what i am following and if this comes out to be positive then one can start the treatment again especially if you are thinking in terms of recurrence so in this particular study the duration of treatment uh, i had kept a bit longer than the previous study uh, it was uh, uh, the uh, average was eight months so um, as i said that there are no standard guidelines for the duration it varies uh, from you know patients to patient so the side effect were very few uh, in my experience generally it is the liver function which we have to monitor and there is no harm in monitoring the serum levels of uh, voriconazole also so this is from the same uh, study and uh, so the take home message is that voriconazole works really very well there is no need to do any uh, debridement as it can lead to you know functional damage of the surrounding structures as far as the orbit is concerned but yes sinus uh, ENT surgeon can decide whether to debride or not serum galactomannan further studies are required but uh, at least I have started getting this done routinely in all my patients thank you Thank you, ma'am, for this enlightening talk on uh, aspergillosis as a rare cause of bacterial uh, or of orbital cellulitis. Ma'am, uh, just to uh, kind of summarize it, that uh, when we keep this in mind as a rare cause of orbital inflammation, so are there any clinical pearls which can help us uh, point towards aspergillosis? Or uh, is it mainly a radiological uh, See, diagnosis? there is a proptosis, a long-standing, means months history, and uh, uh, yes you can consider this as one differential but yeah, on imaging if it is a ill-defined uh, lesion involving the sinuses then that is the as uh, invasive aspergillosis is probably my first you know uh, possible diagnosis if it is ill-defined hyperdense involving the sinuses and the surrounding structures so we must keep it in mind in case we have a non-resolving cellulitis and uh, so we, this should point us towards something which is atypical and we can think of aspergillosis, especially if radiological features are suggested. Yes, if it is ill-defined and there is um, in months there is a history like chronic history, subacute history is there and uh, not very painful and uh, of course sinuses are involved and this becomes the... And it's heartening to know that, that voriconazole has really changed the outcome of these patients. Yes, one should consider once we get the diagnosis, uh, like pathologist, uh, pathologist Dr. Uh, uh, Seema Kashyap is here. She is a senior professor with us and she gives us the diagnosis and we are uh, then uh, like happy that yes, okay, we now know what we have to do. And voriconazole is the... Uh, uh, I would say ma'am, it's a wonder drug which has reduced the rate of incidence. Yes, that is the right, that is the correct because thing to use. But the problem is that it's expensive. But then I feel that uh, there is no harm in starting. Uh, once you give, uh, you know, two, three weeks of IV uh, voriconazole, you can uh, start patient on itraconazole. That also really works well. But I can't say because I, I haven't conducted any study on itraconazole. But that is also a good drug. 
and uh, if voriconazole you feel is not available even itraconazole one can consider thank you thank you ma'am so next we have uh, dr urmil chavla professor in pgims rotak on a topic which has gained notoriety during covid rhino orbital cerebral mucormycosis lessons learned the hard way so i think she is the right person because she has extensive experience and she handled many mucor cases all cases from haryana were being referred to her so over to ma'am thank you thank you dr ali for the kind introduction and i will just take you back to those nightmarish days which everybody of us went through uh, some practically had to go through it and some were through newspapers and news we all uh, were experiencing what was happening in our country so uh, the, i will just share with you my experiences as you all know india visualized a surge in mucormycosis cases since the novel novel coronavirus disease covid-19 outbreak occurred especially after the second wave in may 2021 onwards mucormycosis uh, just a general introduction it's an angio invasive fungal infection which can have multiple clinical presentation which could be rhino orbital cerebral pulmonary git can be involved and in few rare forms cutaneous or cardiac involvement may be also there it is more frequent in immunocompromised host with uncontrolled diabetes being the most important risk factor this we were previously knowing also and this was authenticated during this uh, outbreak also and coronavirus had triggered a new onset diabetes mellitus in many patients who were not diabetic before so did india read mucormycosis right as you all know the country had reported more than 30000 cases and over 2000 deaths were by mucormycosis and the real reason behind the spurt continues to be elusive the disease has been wrongly dubbed as black fungus which it is not and the large number of missing links are still there and it's still too early to jump to conclusions the profile of rocm in india there were various states all over india it was involved but a disproportionate increase in rocm cases was seen in gujarat madhya pradesh and haryana was one of them where i was situated and in haryana also there were few cities which were more involved the reason for that we couldn't guess but gurgaon hisar faridabad rohtak were more involved and also because being a tertiary center in rohtak we were getting more cases probably that was one of the reason and the number of mucor cases in haryana started in 14th may when we had 27 cases were there and the graph just got going and it was not ready to reduce and by 14 june we had 1300 cases and 124 cases had died in among those 1300 cases in rohtak itself where i was the nodal officer uh, from ophthalmology department 254 patients had reported covid plus non covid out of them uh, this data pertains to 20th of june and since it needed a multidisciplinary approach various departments nodal officers were posted and i was one amongst them and these we had the ent department maxillofacial microbiology radiology anesthesia every medicine all team was made so mucormycosis and from our point of view of thalamic the clinical spectrum diagnostic approach and the treatment overview i would give you age wise the uh, range was from less than 20 to 80 more than 80 years patient were maximum mean age was between for, maximum patients were between 41 to 60 years with the mean age being 55 years and then gender the males were involved more and the reason found was that greater outdoor exposure and increased exposure to fungal spores amongst male was considered to be one of the common cause the potential risk factors for covid-19 associated rocm we saw we all knew oxygen support was considered as one of the uh, reason and uh, industrial oxygen that was being used those days extensively was also considered one of the reason for this spurt 73% pa percent patient however showed no oxygen support still they were having mucor most of these had diabetes mellitus and majority received corticosteroid in some form suggesting that contaminated oxygen may not be the driver of infection so there was a debate every time whether it is responsible or not remdesivir and toxilizumab was also considered to play a role corticosteroid have been maligned and the allegation is not totally ill founded because irrational and injudicious use of corticosteroid was a possible cause of rocm there were other potential risk factors diabetes mellitus being the main total number of diabetics that we saw were 190 out of them 121 were old diabetics while 69 reported to have diabetes for the first time during the incidence then what was the covid status of the patients the rt pcr was being done every time and it was found that 47% patients were negative and 53% was positive so it was not that only covid patients were getting having mucor those days the non covid patients were also coming up and six and the uh, duration after covid generally it was in 43% of cases it was seen after more than 14 days of having covid while 56% showed within 14 days of having covid and few patient had delayed ROC, uh, rocm like they had 3 months 
because in the first wave they had COVID and they reported so late. So educating the patients and families with red flag signs is a good situation about they should be aware of the COVID symptoms. Laterality was not something very significant. However, unilateral involvement was seen in 71% while bilateral involvement was seen in 4%. And there were 25% patient, percent patients who did not have uh, orbital involvement. Clinical features, those days we were getting all these tables from IGO and everywhere. This is by Dr. Honavar, sir. Uh, all the symptoms, warning symptoms, nasal stuffiness, foul smell, epistaxis, nasal discharge, nasal, nasal mucosal edema, eyelid edema, then regional pain, worsening headache, proptosis, all these were there. Other symptoms besides the common ones, there were headache, diplopia, toothache, loose teeth. These were seen in few of the patients. They were observed. And otherwise, you can see on this graph, maximum patients had uh, proptosis, nasal discharge. Few came uh, primarily for with loss of vision at that time. Orbital and facial pain was very common. Orbital edema was the most. These are few patients I will just show you which uh, presented to us. Initially with facial edema, nasal crusting, palatal erosion was seen. Tosis was seen in many of them, unilateral to bilateral with partial to complete ophthalmoplegia. There were moderately aggressive cases with proptosis, chemosis, tight globe with ophthalmoplegia. Then there were uh, patients coming with frozen globe at, uh, with mild, mild to moderate restriction was also there and a total frozen globe was also there. Then periorbital discoloration to start with Ishar formation and these were the maximum one, the end variable I labeled them who had maximum Ishar. These patients all reported to our institute and were treated. Besides the symptoms, the signs which are commonly seen, vision PL negative was seen in 35 patients, 102 had 636 to PL positive and uh, similarly we had patients ranging till 612 also. The, besides this, uh, there was uh, proptosis, diplopia, periorbital uh, facial discoloration, ishar formation was seen in less, out of them we would say 1% of cases. Nasal ulcer formation was there, ocular we have already discussed, facial palsy, altered sensorium was there. Retropulsion test... Uh, can you switch this video please on? Uh, retropulsion test is considered to be one of the commonest tests which you can uh, see. Uh, you just press, this is a normal eye. You just see there's there softness when you press the uh, globe. And this is the, this eye which is involved, you will feel a tightness. And this is a simple test done clinically bedside to check the resistance. And it just help us to grade into mild, moderate, severe. Retinal assessment seen showed patients having CRAO, optic dispeller, CRVO and BRVO and dioptic retinopathy. CRAO was considered to be one of the commonest cause that uh, in patients who presented with PL negative vision. Um, going ahead with the investigation, RT-PCR was a must. Diagnostic, initially the patients were all refer, uh, reported into the ENT department as that was the presenting finding in most of them. So a diagnostic nasal endoscopy with tissue biopsy which uh, and uh, KOH staining, then uh, these uh, hyphae were seen. And once they were uh, diagnosed on this, then these cultures were also sent. Biopsy was done. All these cultures were done. Imaging was a must and that time MRI was considered to be the gold standard MRI contrast and wherever feasible it was done in few cases not feasible we had to go with CT also and CT PNS was also done so this was the standard protocol being followed uh, and we could see patients having uninvolved orbit to extraocular mus muscle enlargement and facial orbital involvement was also seen in uh, uh, contrast MRI there were black turbinate sign was the pathognom pathognomic sign though we used to consider besides this the uh, presence of diffuse involvement reaching up to the orbital apex with, with the lack of enhancement and cavernous sinus thrombosis and in some cases bone destruction was also seen so uh, tenting of the globe was another finding which was pathognomic and showing that it is a severe disease maximum patient presented in stage 2 which was the uh, PNS plus orbit sorry stage 3 PNS plus uh, initial stage was only of stage 1 nasal mucosa stage 2 was PNS and stage 3 maximum patient were PNS plus orbit and then uh, later on spread to CNS was also seen in many cases mean age as I told you 52.2 regular monitoring of patients were done for diabetes and aggressive surgical debridement was done uh, another most commonly found comorbidity on all these patients was hypertension beside chronic kidney disease which was also observed transient dyselectrolemia was also seen and few patients had old ischemic heart disease and were patients of post-organ transplant also. 
almost 66% cases as intraorbital extensions and 16% patient develop CNS involvement, most commonly cavernous sinus thrombosis. So the orbital involvement was quite common. And uh, to manage them, the patients were investigated as soon as they came, operated without delay. FES was done wherever uh, needed. And m B also, that was another story. You all know what was the status at that time. Liposomal m C C B had almost disappeared from the market. And wherever it was there, it was at very high prices. So it was becoming very difficult. However, wherever possible, uh, government had tried to provide it and we had been giving it at a dose of 5 to 10 mg per kg per day with a cumulative dose, dose of 3 gram and uh, posaconazole was added also in patients who had renal dysfunction. Uh, so clinically, whenever we suspected IV amphotericin, preferably liposomal was given, confirmed diagnosis, then there were option of non-exentration where only FES and retrobulbar M4 was another new thing that was done, TRAM which was called and in cases where exentration was needed, it was done. So TRAM was uh, this uh, 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 transcutaneous retrobulbar M4 teresin B. It is an off-label application of uh, that time, uh, 1 ml of 3.5 mg M4 teresin B with lidocaine was given and at that, that time the knowledge was not known how to assess the situation and how many injections to be given but with the clinical acumen and with uh, experience of other people and with journals giving us idea, we were giving this drug. So it used to be given in the minor OT. Amphotericin was uh, 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 vial was mixed uh, 10 ml distilled water was uh, mixed in one vial and out of that 0.7 ml was uh, taken and uh, 0.3 ml of distilled water was again added to it to bring it to the concentration of 3.5 mg and then it was given in the quadrant where uh, uh, maximum disease was uh, located on imaging or clinically where we felt. However, the uh, infrotemporal and the supromedial compartment were commonly used um, for this injection. So these are our two injections. Uh, the lig lignocaine was given first, followed by this, the uh, affected eye, uh, the injection was retrobulbary given. I'll just go ahead because of shortage of time. Uh, then uh, this, so this way TRAM was given and TRAM also showed us improvement in vision in many of the cases. When to combine excentration with sinus surgery, whenever it is early limited orbital disease or we can avoid excentration, but when it is an advanced orbital disease or rapidly progressive orbital disease, diffusely involved and tenting of globe as I said is one of the common signs we had to go for excentration. Like in this case, orbital apex plus cavernous sinus involvement was there. QH was positive, MRI contrast was was showing cavernous sinus attenuation and so we had to plan an excentration. Similarly, tenting of globe was an important sign as I told you. Tenting of globe is defined as posterior globe angle of less than 130 degree. A normal angle of globe is 150 or more but when the uh, due to this disease occupying the uh, posterior area, it causes tenting, it increases the optic nerve stretching due to increase in orbital tension due to inflammation and abscess and that was a uh, pathognomic sign again and we did excentration in all such cases. Uh, I'll go ahead with this. So this was the excentrated sockets after excentration and though in these also we had healthy orbital sockets. We found diseased orbital socket while doing excentration. Lid sparing was done generally. Patients were kept on follow up. Uh, even uh, after the uh, excentration there were cases which were coming like this. So a long follow up was needed for all them. Prosthetic rehabilitation was a must and uh, oc ocularists were involved in this and we know spectacle mounted prostheses are there which are lightweight user friendly and economical and patients are still coming for follow-up and they are still using these uh, for cosmetic rehabilitation. So challenge was that there was a sudden influx of huge number of cases at that time and it was an unprecedented mucus tsunami. There was deficiency of infrastructure, both man and machinery. There were paucity, paucity of beds, almost nil ammunition, ammunition because m 4 and posaconazole initial supply chain failure was there. Initially, intra-department communication was less. Everybody was in a panic till a mucus committee was formed and then things streamlined and public awareness due to wrong messages and there was total chaos and state of confusion in the country. So take home message was from my side was that prevention and early control of mucomycosis is the need of the R and we should detect it early rather than uh, waiting for it. High morbidity and mortality with significant facial, facial disfigurement in survivors has been seen. We have to remember now for our next, uh, for uh, future that moderation in steroid and uh, use should be there, strict control of diabetes. We should be aware of the red flag signs. Even now COVID is there so much. So we have to be careful about all these things. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Urmil, for such a wonderful uh, talk.
her enthusiasm and her you know <laughs> uh, teaching skills always you know motivate all of us and uh, uh, though the, i learned from ma'am i'm proud to be doing my observership under ma'am and dr rachna ma'am so i always feel proud that thank you so much uh, thank you dr romil uh, all right so uh, though that was uh, you know very unfortunate time that uh, we saw that mucor epidemic but i think the only positive side of uh, it was that we uh, 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 have now you know a treatment protocol in place whether it is you know medical treatment or uh, whether it is you know a treatment by oculoplastic surgeons because in the pre covid era hardly we used to see such patients and most of the de them were like you know in advanced stage and we had to do excentration but this was the time when we saw like uh, like uh, uh, all sorts of uh, patients and uh, this was the time when lot of emphasis was given on tram the uh, the uh, orbital injection amphotericin b injections so i think that was the only positive side of it that we are now uh, more confident in treating uh, these patients and at least we know the prognosis like how it's uh, going to behave and uh, to certain extent we are able to probably prevent excentration uh, in these patients so that is the only positive uh, side of it so uh, thank you dr ormel now i would like to invite uh, dr rachna meel our uh, you know um though young but uh, highly skilled and experienced you know uh, uh, faculty we have in rp center aims uh, she'll be uh, talking about igg4 orbitopathy humbled by those words uh, from my own teacher thank you so much yes so before i start i just wanted to ask how many people here are oculoplastic surgeons are all of you oculoplastic surgeons how many of you do tumors or excise them are there any pathologists here including us no, you are asking excluding us of okay. course <laughs> <laughs> okay all right so i don't see any hands so i think then i will just begin with i see igg4 is something that is recent so have you come across any patients that you know had igg4 any of you all right so okay let's go on so igg4 related disease is something which is new and uh, was first described recently 2003 so there were a number of uh, things that many patients had which we thought were unrelated including pancreatitis the uh, type 1 pancreatitis redel's thyroiditis and uh, retroperitoneal fibrosis and also mecklenburg's disease and over time people realized that some of the patients have all these manifestations in various combinations along with a histopathology which was unique to all of them and they were combined with this single characteristic histopathological picture and that's one uh, that's when igg4 related disease came into existence that was 2003 now this is a uh, immune mediated fibroinflammatory condition and it is basically do we have a pointer it's basically characterized by uh, three things on histo uh, three uh, characteristics clinical histopathological and serological so you have multiple masses in the body it may be in various organs and one of them which may be orbit or eyelid and then again you may have a histopathological picture i'm not going to talk about that much we'll touch upon it later and i think dr seema is also going to talk about it and then of course you have a serological picture where you have a raised concentration of igg4 levels in the blood so this is just to show you how what all organs can be involved and there are though a number of uh, organs that can be involved but the most common ones that are involved are pancreas and in head and neck it is the uh, the lacrimal gland so now why is it important to know about igg4 and that is why i asked you first that how many of you actually do tumors because igg4 can present as an orbital mass and eyelid mass and if we do not know about it we will not look for it and we will not ask our histopathologist to do a igg4 staining and therefore we we may actually miss it and this has a systemic association 
which can have an end organ damage, can be life-threatening at times, and which can really affect the life of the patient. So we need to know that an IgG4 disease can involve orbit in the form of a mass, so whenever we are excising a mass. And the second reason is that some of us may also think that it's a malignancy. So it's not a malignancy. It's not a lymphoma. It is a lymphoproliferative disorder, which has a characteristic presentation which has a characteristic increase in plasma cells, all of which are IgG4 positive, but it is not a malignancy. So now that brings me to the diagnostic criteria. The first diagnostic criteria was given in 2011 by Umhera et al. And then this was again revised in 2020. And then also the pathology team came up with a consensus statement on this in 2012. And then of course the rheumatology society came with another one. And there was also the organ-specific criteria, which I think Dr. Bhavna touched upon in her first uh, presentation. So let's talk about the diagnostic criteria that was given by Umhera Tal and which is what is most commonly used to make the diagnosis. So what do you have is you have swelling or masses in multiple organs. So we as ophthalmologists will come across a patient who's coming to you with proptosis or an eyelid mass. And... When you are doing uh, excision and or an incision biopsy, what you characteristically find is a plasmolymphocytic infiltration along with some amount of fibrosis, which is also evident clinically when you see the patient. And the tumor, if you can palpate it, is quite uh, firm. And that is indicative of fibrosis. And then, of course, there's an infiltration by plasma cells, which are positive for IgG4, but that you will only know if you do a IHC for it. If you don't do a IHC, they are simply plasma cells lying there. So it's a plasmolymphocytic infiltration that the pathologist will see. And until and unless you ask the pathologist, he will not look up for IgG4 positivity in these cases. The other thing is the elevated serum IgG4 concentration, which is said to be raised specifically in these cases, if it is more than 135 mg per dl. So not any increase is increase enough for coating it to be associated with IgG4 disease. It has to be greater than 135 mg per dl. So if you have all these three, then we call it a definite IgG4 related disease. But if you have a combination of clinical and just the pathology, then it is probable. And if you have a clinical with serology, it becomes possible disease. So now what modification was made uh, in this criteria in 2020? So when first the diagnosis, diagnostic criteria was given, a lot of other specialities came out with organ-specific criteria, And those organ-specific criteria were added to the diagnostic criteria. And there were certain remarks that were added specifically when we were making a diagnosis, one of which was the requirement of a biopsy. So if you have an increased IgG4 level, you cannot just assume that the patient is having IgG4 disease. The other thing is many cases of malignancy were missed out and misdiagnosed. So as far as possible, one should try to do a biopsy to get the diagnosis. Then of course, they also remarked about the serum IgG4 levels, which could be raised in a number of other diseases, the systemic inflammatory diseases. And you have to rule out those systemic inflammatory diseases before you uh, you quote it as a IgG4 disease. So a certain number of other things were added as a word of caution so that misdiagnosis would not happen. And an organ specific criteria was also given for ocular disease, which included, I mean, it was essentially what I've already talked about. But what was highlighted was that sometimes you may not find fibrosis in an orbital case of IgG4. And also you might find some germinal centers, which is specific to orbital disease, and you may not find it in other organ uh, when they are involved in IgG4. Other than that, the criteria for the number of cells per high power field has been very variable. While it was 10 in the first diagnostic criteria, in the organ specific criteria, they said 50. And if you look at the consensus of the pathologist, they are saying if it's more than 100, even in absence of fibrosis or a dense lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate, even on ab an absence of those two, if you have an IgG4 uh, positive plasma cells more than 100 per high power field, 
you can say that it is highly suggestive of IDD4 related orbital disease. So I think that is more of a pathologist's purview. But coming back to clin clinical uh, side, epidemiology wise, this affects middle aged people and has a male pre uh, preponderance. And it has a biphasic progression with an initial inflammatory phase followed by fibrotic. I will not go into pathogenesis. Let's talk about orbital disease. So the mean age is again 55 years. The male-female ratio is not as high for, sister, for the orbital disease as systemic disease. And the most common orbital structure involved is lacrimal gland. So you may have a patient coming to you with bilateral lacrimal gland enlargement who may be having IgG4. Rarely, the uh, optic nerve may be involved, orbital bone, but those are rare case scenarios. Now, this is really interesting. So if someone has an IgG4-related uh, disease, only 4 to 34% will have an orbital involvement. So if you have a, a known systemic disease, 4 to 34% may have an orbital involvement. But if, if a patient has ophthalmic disease, then almost 80% of those patients will have systemic involvement even uh, at the time of presentation or maybe later on. So you need to screen these patients again and again for other organ involvements. And that's why you need to diagnose it correctly. And this is more so when you have bilateral involvement or a lacrimal gland involvement. So again, we need to know whether it is IDG4 or not. <clears throat> Bilaterality in orbital disease is almost reported in 60%. So unilateral IDG4, is it really unilateral? Go back and see the radiology. You may be missing it on the other side. More than 50% are actually bilateral. How do you look for rest of the organ involvement? Do a PET scan. There are no guidelines, but this is good. It helps you to find out rest of the organ involvement. I have only 20 seconds, so I'm just going to go on to the... I'll just quickly go through the imaging findings. So this, these have been described. Lacrimal gland enlargements, extraocular muscle enlargements, and then again, you could have, yeah, this is something very characteristic. This is the infraorbital nerve in the infraorbital canal, and this is enlarged. And this is thought to be sort of characteristic for IgG4 disease. So if you see an extraocular muscle enlargement, along with this, think of IgG4. And yes, how is it different from pseudotumor? We keep on talking about orbital inflammation, and People keep on saying a lot of orbital inflammatory disease is now IgD4 actually. How is it different? So extraocular muscle involvement in myositis typically involves tendons. IgD4 does not. The other thing, myositis is painful. IgD4 is not. Myositis in fact involves the medial rectus, the superior rectus. IgD4 involves the lateral rectus. So those are some things which may help you to, you know, start thinking of IgD4. Active disease will require treatment. Sometimes if a structure like optic nerve is involved, you might need emergent treatment. Asymptomatic patients, you can just follow them up. So just follow them up, screen them for rest of the organ involvement, and that's about it. Treatment typically is with steroids, and it is so responsive to steroids that if it is not responding to steroids, then you should, have, you should go back and look at your diagnosis. That is what the Rheumatology Association says, and a lot of other people say, that if a case of IDG4 is not responding to steroids, go back, check your diagnosis, because that is rare. We usually start with 0.6 mg per kg per day, and then of course it is tapered, but it has to be a slow taper. That is what you have to remember. Remissions are good, but relapses are 30 to 70 percent, I think in a previous uh, presentation. Uh, I think it was Dr. Bhavna, and she said 70% of them actually relapse. So relapse rate is high. And uh, what do you do if a case relapse after you've given steroid? So you could try a steroid therapy again. That is the first thing that everyone does. And if that does not work or the patient is having severe side effects, that's when you start disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. And you could, there is some data on use of rituximab. This is the only drug that can be used alone for inducing a remission. So DMARDs, when you're using, that has to be in combination with steroid, but rituximab standalone can be used for inducing remissions. I will not go into this. I Yeah. So now the risk factors, male patient, young age onset, I'll not read all of them. The cramel gland involvement is a risk factor for recurrence. So if the cramel gland is involved, there is a risk of recurrence. That is something that we have to remember. And let's see. So this is the data that we have seen over the past five years. Yes, most of our patients are male. 
um, and most of the patients are in 21 to 60 years of group proptosis is the major presentation inferior extraconal space is what we found was mainly involved these are just some case pictures so this patient came to us with redness along with a little bit of a proptosis and limitation of extraocular movements in upgaze and you can see there is a mass infraorbital compartment along with an enlargement of this infraorbital now and he responded very well to steroids this is another patient again bilateral redness with pain looking closely he had puk and then when you look at the imaging you see there is a there is a mass here which is showing some peripheral uh, sort so this is t2 so this cannot be enhancement sorry i don't know why it's it just keeps going forward yeah so this is the enhancement here and this is the fibrosis which causes it to be dark on t2 so which shows that it is a fibrotic lesion and look how well he has responded to steroids his serum levels were more than 135 again another case very good response to steroids this was a childhood case which presented to us at 24 years of age and he came to us with a vision loss in the less affected eye which is this eye and he responded beautifully to steroids again and most of the times they will just stay good once they've responded they may not have any activity for a long time and then another one here of course surgical excision was done but it showed igg4 so that was just to show you the the spectrum of patients that we have seen so the take home message is that igg4 related disease should be considered in a differential diagnosis of any long-standing orbital tumor which is not having any pain and biopsy actually is important to rule out malignancy as well as to make a diagnosis in this case igg4 positivity is non-specific it can happen in systemic immune disorder so don't over diagnose be careful with your diagnosis and it has a good response to steroids and most importantly once you make a diagnosis follow up the patient to see if he has other organ involvement thank you yeah yeah that's our team at api center yeah it's not showing there sorry <laughs> thank you dr Rishna. thank you so much for such a comprehensive presentation a topic which is tough and new for so many of us so probably no comment and i think we are here in a short amount of time so we go ahead with the next talk our uh, next talk is by another young and very dynamic uh, oculoplasty surgeon from Haryana. From from uh, another young and dynamic oculoplasty surgeon from Haryana from Kalpana Chavla Medical College, Karnal, Dr. Rolly Sooth. She's doing a lot of oculoplasty work over there. Uh, she's going to present on uh, atypical aggressive orbital infections, source of nightmares. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, ma'am, for the kind introduction. So today I'll be speaking on atypical aggressive orbital infections, how not to make them a source of nightmares. So diseases of the orbit can uh, generally be classified into either vascular, endocrine, infective, inflammatory or neoplastic. So the symptomatology usually encompasses uh, either swelling, erythema, pain or possibly loss of function. And it can also be a manifestation of a systemic process. So infections of the orbit and periorbital tissues are a particularly important subset of orbital inflammatory disease because of the associated local and systemic morbidity. And visual loss in these patients can occur in up to 11% of 11% uh, and significant systemic morbidity may also occur. So what is the etiology of orbital infection? This has already broadly been covered by Dr. Bhavna. So just a quick overview. It can either be uh, due to a contiguous spread from uh, neighboring structures, most commonly the nasal uh, sinuses or from the lacrimal system. It can occur as a sequelae of orbital fracture or preceptor cellulitis or facial necrotizing fasciitis. It can be because of a hepatogenous spread from a dental infection, a subacute bacterial endocarditis or an opportunistic infection in a debilitated host. It can happen uh, as an overimposition on a pre-existing orbital disease such as an occult malignancy or an orbital dermoid with or without fistula. It can also occur because of direct injury such as a penetrating orbital injury with or without foreign body, a sinus injury or any other lid or plasty surgery. So today I'll just be sharing two cases of atypical aggressive orbital infections which did give us a few sleepless nights. 
So this was the first case in which a 52 year old female presented to us with bilateral painful lid swelling for the past 2 weeks. She gave a history of treatment for of a by a quack for which no documentation was available and on examination there was a bilateral lid edema with periocular skin necrosis and scar formation. Now this scar had a tree bark like consistency and was insensitive to tactile and pain stimulus. So at this point we had to make an immediate clinical uh, diagnosis. So a uh, Uh, based on the clinical symptomatology and uh, we made a working diagnosis of periorbital necrotizing fasciitis and the patient was immediately taken to the OR where surgical debridement was done now this surgical debridement has to be done till uh, you this uh, reach a healthy plane and which is evidenced by the presence of petechial hemorrhages and elicitation of nociceptive stimuli and the patient was immediately started on broad spectrum antibiotics so this is just a short video showing the uh, how we took out the uh, the entire scar tissue this was taken out in toto and we have to ensure that we are uh, taking it out up to the healthy margins and we have to do it in a plane till we reach the healthy vascular tissue so this has to be done very patiently and in this case we were able to take out the uh, scar tissue en toto which was later sent for histopathological examination and culture sensitivity the same was repeated on the lower lid and also on the left lower lid so this was a patient on the post op uh, day 2 when we see we have a healthy bed but there are areas of necrosis uh point of So uh the culture of the debrided tissue showed a gram negative uh, klebsiella all the other hematological and the systemic investigations were normal so keeping uh, this in mind the sensitivity to amikacin the patient was started on amikacin and there was a daily wound care was done with the form of slough removal and excision of necrotic tissue and the margins and wound dressing with gauze soaked in povidone iodine So we saw a gradual improvement in the patient of course this takes weeks this is not something which happens in one day or two days so this is what the patient gradually started showing improvement after 2 to 2 to 3 weeks so the patient was responding well and but we must remember that we are giving long term systemic therapy so the patient started developing a uh, systemic toxicity so at this point we were at a dilemma of what to do because we had to discontinue amikacin and uh, the causative organism was sensitive to that particular antibiotic only so what we started doing was dipping the gauze in amikacin and cleaning the wound patiently with amikacin every day followed by povidone iodine so this was continued till there was a complete resolution of infection and healthy granulation tissue which we started observing at week 4 So here is a gradual improvement which we saw, and finally, we uh, the patient developed a healthy scar tissue formation. She was not convinced for skin grafting or any kind of uh, cosmetic plastic surgery, and so this is uh, when uh, the end point where we were able to uh, save the patient's life and to save the patient's eye, and she had a healthy formation. There was a complete resolution of the cutaneous defect by the ninth week, though she did have a mild leg of thalamus. There was no exposure keratopathy. So periorbital necrotizing fasciitis usually occurs after trauma in uh, up to 75% of cases it is usually seen in immunocompromised patients and the causative organism is gram positive group a beta hemolytic streptococcus but in our case there was no history of trauma the patient was immunocompetent and the organism was a totally new organism which had not uh, in this case was not previously reported so we must always keep the, these things in mind when a patient of atypical Uh, orbital infections presents to us so a prompt diagnosis immediate intervention and a multidisciplinary approach is required and targeted antibiotic therapy can help contain the spread of infection to the orbit and cervical region now coming to the second case this was a case of a 14 year old boy who came uh, to the casualty with complaining of pain and foul smelling discharge for the past one month he was an uncontrolled juvenile diabetic and he gave a history of a trivial trauma with a poorly healing wound 3 months back so as you can see there was comp- uh, there was massive orbital swelling and a gaping uh, uh, wound at the uh, in the orbit and there was no evidence of globe and this uh, swelling and this infection was also seen up to the in the mouth so this is what we saw when we opened the bandage so if you look carefully you can see that the whole cavity was teeming with maggots So immediately the patient was shifted to the OR and uh, the removal of the necrotic tissue and removal of the maggots was done meticulously 
and we were we took out approximately 30 to 40 maggots from this cavity so the management of hyperglycemia was done and the patient was hemodynamically stabilized and was started on both uh, broad spectrum antibiotics and wound dressing was done so this is what the patient looked like and uh, this is after the dressing so once the patient was hemodynamically stabilized he was again taken up in the or this this time we had a multidisciplinary team consisting of an ent surgeon a neurosurgeon and a dental surgeon along with ophthalmologist of course the entire area was explored and the debridement was done all the uh, surrounding bones were found to be necrotic which were systematically removed even the nasal cavity this was endoscopically explored and all the necrotic tissue was removed till healthy tissue was obtained the dental cavity was too was uh, totally infiltrated all of this was removed till we got a healthy tissue and an obturator was put so this were the necrotic bones which were sent for culture sensitivity histopathology and these were the mr uh, scans which showed extensive infiltration of the orbit destruction of the orbit and with the scans we uh, were given the provisional diagnosis of mucormycosis so this was a time when uh, this patient came to us around 3 i think 3 and a half years back before, before none of us had uh, mucormycosis was not a household name covid had not uh, yet entered our lives so the patient the diagnosis of mucormycosis was made and uh, this was a case of committent ocular mucormycosis with superimposed ocular myasis or maggots the patient was immediately started on amphotericin b meticulous cleaning of cavity with turpentine oil was done every day and the patient was hemodynamically stabilized <coughs> so mucormycosis now as we all know and i will not be going to that as it has been extensively covered <coughs> sorry it is a rare opportunistic fungal infection ocular myos myasis accounts for 5 to 14% cases of human myasis and both of them have common risk factors which include neglected open wounds suppurative lesions long standing ulcers and asin and debilitated individuals as this child was now both these conditions required prolonged therapy with multi speciality and multi disciplinary care so this patient was with us for more than i think 3 uh, months so the resolution which you see now was uh, very gradual and uh, you know there was re um, reappearance of a maggot once or twice and we had to be very meticulous send the patient being in a government setup send the patient to different departments and get their follow up done so it requires a lot of uh, patience so the take home points are aggressive orbital infections are ophthalmic emergencies they need to be tackled aggressively so but we do not need to wait for uh, radiological investigations or hematological investigations a prompt clinical diagnosis and immediate intervention needs to be done so for that our needle of suspicion should be high so the eyes see what the mind knows so we should keep in mind these rare atypical orbital infections when a case which we do not usually see presents to us any delay in intervention can lead to morbidity and mortality and these usually require a multidisciplinary approach so we all need to get together to get our patient okay and of course a lot of patient from the side of the treating uh, doctors and from the side of the patient can usually get a smile on the patient's face in that thank you thank you dr ali wonderful presentation i would say very difficult cases and very well managed i was not knowing actually thank you <laughs> you're doing really wonderful job thank you Kav. thank you ma since uh, we are all taking a little bit liberty because there's no session in this hall after our ic so probably we are taking few minutes of liberty each of us uh, our next speaker ma'am will introduce before that i would like to invite dr rolika bansal on the dais she is the keynote speaker of our session after the this talk so just come over rolika then i'll introduce you later okay. abhi ma'am please start dr sina so uh, i would like to invite uh, professor seema uh, kashyap she is senior professor in the department of ocular pathology rp center aims and uh, she is the one who throws light on most of our cases and we are happy that she is there you know to uh, uh, at least tell us what exactly we are dealing with completely trustworthy and uh, i think uh, very much uh, uh, experienced more than probably 30 years if i am not uh, wrong dr yeah. seema so she has been there with us in the department of ocular pathology so she'll be uh, talking about uh, you know pathology of uh, orbital inflammation and infections uh, okay 
Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Neelam, for the kind words. Uh, today, I shall be talking on the uh, pathology of orbital inflammations and infections. I have divided into orbital infective lesions and or orbital non-infective lesions. So, in the infective lesions, I shall show you some interesting cases of fungal infections, but parasitic tuberculosis and bacterial uh, infections. So first dealing with uh, some fungal infection, this was a 68 year old male who had a right eye proptosis for two months. This was a firm hard mass palpable at the intralateral aspect and um, here you can see on the CT scan. So since this was a palpable mass, we did an FNAC and on FNAC, this is the papinicular stain, we could see numerous giant cells granulomas in the background there were inflammatory cells and these are the red cells there's a hyper view of uh, one of the giant cell and if you look carefully there was an unstained query unstained fungal hyphae in this so fungal stain were positive and this was a case of aspergillosis the patient was put on antifungal treatment and he responded very well without having to undergo any um, biopsy Another case, this case, uh, biopsy was sent to us since FNAC couldn't be done, as well, it was a deep-seated lesion. And in this particular biopsy, what we can see is numerous epithelioid cell granulomas. Here you have giant cells, here you can see giant cells. And in the inflammatory infiltrate, we had uh, lymphocytes, plasma cells, and the most predominant one was eosinophils. So once you start seeing eosinophils in the background along with epithelioid cell granulomas, giant cells, think of fungal infection or a par parasitic infection. Fungal infection, you ask for a silver methanamine stain and here in this case it was positive. Here you can see the septate fungal hyphae with acute angle branching. This was a case of aspergillus. But if you see a similar picture and uh, if you see palisading histiocytes, then you think of a parasitic infection. Uh, this was another young patient, an immunocompromised patient. It, uh, she had a large destructive mass and here is a CT picture of this. And uh, on histopathology, we saw large areas of necrosis. There was no inflammation whatsoever. And in these necrotic uh, areas, we could see these unstained fungal hyphae on h &E stain. And of course, uh, silver stain did pick up all these hyphae. You can see these irregular width of uh, fungal hyphae without any septae and there is right angle branching. So always in mucor mycosis, you'll have large areas of necrosis. Inflammation may or may not be there. And these are very aggressive uh, fungal infection. They tend to invade into the blood vessel wall also. Another case, um, this is a young girl who had this uh, huge swelling and uh, when we aspirated it was just uh, pus like material. Uh, this is the um, CT picture of uh, this girl and um, then a biopsy was sent. We couldn't uh, get a conclusive diagnosis on FNAC. So biopsy was done and here you could see large number of epithelioid cell granulomas all these are epithelioid cell granulomas or uh, this is a low power picture okay this is a high power picture of one of the epithelioid cell granulomas you can see numerous giant cells here there's one langan's giant cell along with necrosis here also there's a large areas of necrosis so once you see caseating granulomas you think of tuberculosis AFB stain, you ask for seal nelson stain, AFB stain which is positive. So this was a tuberculous orbital infection. And this is the post-op picture of this girl. Another case of a young girl with proptosis. Here you can see the CT picture of this uh, cystic lesion and you can see the double wall sign. And uh, on uh, the, this is the gross picture, the pearly white cystic uh, structure which we got, uh, which is the hydrated cyst, and the ectocyst. This is classical ectocyst shows laminated eosinophilic membranes, and you may see scolices. Here you have these scolices. There are these hooklets also over here, and this is a germinal layer. This is a post-op picture of this mm, child. I have added cysty circles, although this was not orbital. Uh, just to show you that this is a classical scolex of cysty circus, these undulating eosinophilic membranes and there is a sucker also over here. 
Here in this particular case, there's a cyst wall also with inflammation. And this is the gross picture with the scolex. Um, next case is a 42-year-old male with a supratemporal orbital mass, which was increasing in size for five months. Ill-defined heterogeneously enhancing lesion in the preceptal region with extension in the suprolateral aspect and it was query inflammatory. This is the uh, mass which was sent, excision biopsy 2.5 by 1.5 centimeters and these are the yellow necrotic areas which uh, were seen on gross examination. On histopathology HNE stain, what we saw were these large encircling areas of fibrosis. This is all fibrosis and in the center you had numerous micro abscesses here also you can see the micro abscesses and in the center of these micro abscesses you can see these organisms which had this splendor hoffley phenomena at the peripheries so to con confirm the diagnosis we did per iodic acid shift state which is positive in these colonies bacterial colonies silver methanamine was positive and they were positive for acid fast bacilli. So the, this was a case of nocardiosis, which is very rare. Originally, they were considered to be fungus, but now we know that they are aerobic gram-positive non-motile branching filamentous bacteria. It's a rare cause of ocular infections. It can cause keratitis, scleritis, conjunctivitis, and many other structures can be in, uh, involved. So it should be uh, kept in the differential diagnosis. Now coming on to the non-infective lesions, uh, this was, a, a, I don't have the clinical picture, but this uh, patient had um, orbital mass and this was the biopsy that uh, was sent to us. Now I showed you a tuberculous biopsy and in contrast to that, what you can see in this particular case also, there are numerous epithelioid cell granulomas. In the background, there are few lymphocytes but there, are no, there was no necrosis whatsoever. So this was a case of sarcoidosis, serum ACE levels were increased. So whenever there is non-necrotizing epithelioid cell granulomas, you think of sarcoidosis and investigate the patient for the same. Uh, another case, this was a 24-year-old male with a medial canthal mass in the left eye for one month. The MRI orbit uh, showed a heterogeneous lesion, query infected acrocystoceal was the diagnosis and clinically the diagnosis was sarcoidosis, histocytic lesion, oblique awareness. FNAC was non-contributory since very few spindle cells were seen. P anchor and C anchor however were negative, patient was lost to follow up but he reappeared presented again with a sudden increase in uh, proptosis. So these are the h &E pictures or the histopath pictures where uh, in this particular case we saw numerous epithelioid cell granulomas. These are granulomas. You can see giant cells. In addition, we saw these coagulative necrosis. Here also you can see coagulative necrosis and there's a lot of inflammation in the background with eosinophils. And what was striking in this particular case was we had these vessels. The, uh, here you can see these vessels which are almost obliterated, the lumen is almost obliterated, the vessel wall is infiltrated by inflammatory cells. Here also you can see that the, there was vasculitis, necrotizing vasculitis in this particular case. So you had coagulative necrosis, you had vasculitis, you had granulomas. So this was diagnosed as Wegener's granulomatosis or earlier, now it is known as granulomatosis with polyangiitis GPA. Earlier, it was known as Wegener's, as we are all familiar with. It's a systemic disorder characterized by necrotizing vasculitis. Typically affects uh, these blood vessels, small and medium size in the orbit respiratory tract in the renal uh, uh, glomerulonephritis. But there's a limited form of the disease also, which involves just a single organ such as the eye, where orbit is one of the most frequently involved ocular structures in GPA. More often, secondary to extension to of the sinus pathology. It's a complex and potentially lethal disease with a high mortality rate if left untreated. Uh, this is my last case. Patient presented with um, proptosis. Here you can see in the CT picture, there's a large mass. Um, so on histopathology, sorry. On histopathology, what we saw was dense lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. 
here this is just dense almost looking like a lymphoid follicle there's a lot of inflammation in addition i don't know what's okay in addition to this lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate there were large areas of fibrosis in fact these large collagenous bands were intermingling it was uh, interspersed within the inflammatory infiltrate and as you can see in this inflammatory infiltrate it's mainly plasma cells along with few eosinophils so this particular case lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate where the plasma cells were predominant storiform fibrosis was there there was phlebitis in this particular case so we did immunohistochemistry where igg as well as igg4 was strongly positive i shall not talk much about igg4 it has already been dealt with uh, dr rachna the incidence has been reported in uh, as 5 to 20% and lacrimal gland is the most commonly involved site there are these major histopath uh, features along with minor histopath features and we had all of them in this particular case igg4 igg ratio should be more than 40% and yeah there are st uh, studies where more than 10 per hypa field or more than 50 or more than 100 but uh, we generally take cut off as more than 40 per hypa field in our cases so finally the take home message is the orbital infections and inflammations which include a broad spectrum of orbital diseases uh, which can be idiopathic infectious from primary or secondary inflammatory processes and we should be able to diagnose these properly and manage these orbital diseases in a timely manner to avoid permanent vision loss and possibly save the patient's life and the so close collaboration between the clinician and the pathologist is very essential thank you thank you dr seema kashyap for that wonderful uh, talk i think pathologist job is the most difficult job because they come to the final diagnosis just on the basis of pink and blue colors you know so that is what we <laughs> we as you know oculoplasty surgeon see so thank you so much but slowly and slowly they are becoming indispensable for us nahi we really they, need they, them. Uh, that's the most important uh, yeah. i think uh, job I, i said most yeah. difficult in fact you know yeah. and very thank important for so us thank you so much to all the speakers of this ic thanks for their presence and thanks to all the audience and uh, we have a keynote address left i'm oh, and uh, before i invite the keynote speaker i am also thankful to dr praveen arora sir he is a very renowned ophthalmic surgeon of haryana sirsa belt a very renowned uh, phaco and refractive surgeon and doing general oculoplasty also his daughter also a very renowned we are thank you sir for being present over here thank you now i would like to invite uh, we have a keynote address uh, attached to our ic and that is by none other than dr rolika bansal whom i came to know few years back just uh, as a fellow of dr santosh which she finished a fellowship in 2021 and now she has an in identity of her own and i am very proud to say that she has backed so many awards i think aap logo mein se jo bhi aios ki program book dekhte hoge ya jo bhi you all must be knowing she is uh, bagging so many awards and she is uh, also the recipient of uh, this award uh, sujata savitri rao award uh, and she is going to speak on local local tumor control by adjuvant plaque breakage therapy in conjunctival melanoma so becoming a keynote speaker at such a young age and being dynamic is a really a proud point and i always tell her that she is really going to do good in future and besides despite of that she is very modest and very humble that i want to add thank you rolika thank you so much ma'am this uh, lecture is actually uh, this keynote lecture is actually very weird for me because uh, first of all it's in front of people way senior than me so uh, i do not really, i feel very no, odd in giving a keynote time. lecture and at the same time i'm kind of taking it as a blessing that i'm presenting my first keynote lecture in front of all of you yes. and uh, you all <laughs> so i'll proceed with my topic and i thank my mentor for giving me the opportunity to uh, witness these cases and the beautiful surgeries as well so the topic is local tumor control by adjuvant plaque breakage therapy in conjunctival melanoma 
So conjunctival melanoma happens to be a rare lethal malignancy. Less than 1% of all whole body melanomas are conjunctival melanomas. The incidence ranging from 0.4 to 0.8 per million. Quite rare. And at the same time, a variety of treatment modalities have been followed. Primary surgical excision with or without cryotherapy, adjuvant radiotherapy, enucleation, even radical measures like exenteration and genetics guided targeted therapy are also available. So uh, a lot of studies have been done with different combinations of the same. And this is one of the very uh, vibrant studies, which is a large, sen a large uh, study done on 288 patients, which showed that there was local recurrence in 19% cases and a cumulative local recurrence of 5% by one year and 37% by 10 year. So this is quite a high incidence. And again, uh, Shields et al. have also shown that local tumor control, uh, local tumor recurrence was 74%. And you can see over here that melanoma related lymph node metastasis and systemic metastasis was 25%. So this is quite a high number. And we observed that this was because there were variable uh, interventions that were put in. So we thought that why not uh, try to see with whether we can streamline the entire process and we can eliminate the concept of radical measures. So we went on to uh, do a study wherein there were primary surgical excision done with cryotherapy included and adjuvant radiotherapy also given. So uh, primary plaque brachytherapy refers to when we have examined the corneoscleral invasion on clinical examination with support of imaging, that is ASOCT and ultrabiomicroscopy. And secondary plaque brachytherapy is that when we have done the excision, we send for histopathology and we know that there is base involvement, so we go ahead with brachytherapy. And we must remember that high rate of local tumor recurrence is related to high rate of metastasis also. So we conducted a retrospective interventional study in which 15 patients were assessed. It's a small number, but considering the rarity, it's quite a high number at one particular center by a single surgeon. So we saw a variety of presentations. We saw lesions which were dark pigmented flat and elevated lesions as these. And with a prominent feeder vessel, that's how conjunctival melanoma is usually presented. This is a 16-year-old boy here with intrinsic vascularity on the surface. And you can see scleral fixity, which can be checked with the bud as we do in our clinics. And corneal involvement must be noted in these patients clinically. And as I said, ultrasound biomicroscopy showed evidence scleral invasion and even orbital invasion in few of our cases. Over here, you can see that the maximum width was 9.9 .9 and maximum height of 1.13, just quite a significant one. In these cases, usually we resort to enucleation. And ASOCT also confirmed the corneoscleral invasion. Uh, as I said, the secondary brachytherapy was done after histopathology confirmation. That was the, the lesion was seen as a pigmented lesion with full thickness involvement. Spindle to epithelioid atypical cells were seen with cytoplasmic melanin pigments and pigmented lesion with base involvement was confirmed. So after all of this, including immunohistochemistry, we just observed that what would be the demography. Median age was 35 years and we had our cases presenting from an 8-year-old to a 65-year-old. So you can see a variety, so it can present at any age. And mostly they, uh, they were arising from primary acquired melanosis in 47% cases in our study and nevus 40% with de novo lesions being 13% as well. The tumor diameter varied from 4 to 17 mm and tumor height varied from 1.5 to 6 mm. So you can imagine that's a, a quite a variation. This is a, a surgical intervention that I'm displaying over here. There's a 65 year old male who came with extensive spread. He had had two excision biopsies elsewhere, recurrent conjunctival melanoma and the AJCC staging was CT3C. So you can see over here that as we went on with surgical intervention, we took 4 mm clinically clear margins. In this particular patient, lateral rectus was also involved. So we had to assess it uh, on the basis of uh, MRI and the lesion was excised. Very slow and meticulous dissection was done and lamellar sclerectomy was performed. Uh, very carefully we had to do that so that we don't cause a scleral perforation and the involved lateral rectus was also excised. The residual pigment was excised and the lateral rectus was reinserted to its original location. 
the hot plaque was placed over the lesion that was over the uh, surface and uh, the dosimetry was kept as 2 mm depth since this was a diffuse lesion we had to do two rotations of the plaque so that we cover the entire surface area and uh, we also went ahead with double free stock cryotherapy for the edge and the base in order to make sure that the entire tumor has been excised and surface reconstruction was done with amniotic membrane graft and glue and to make sure that we don't get simplified on we even did simplifron ring insertion and tarsorophy so the plaque type that we used were notch or round and the dose was 10000 centigrade kept for the apex dose the depth was 2 to 3 mm depth and the dose duration ranged from 11.5 to 74 hours you can see that this particular patient had beautiful uh, um, post operative outcome and this is after 8 years that the patient who had developed recurrence within 3 to 4 months had developed no recurrence after 8 years and this also was a lesion i think this is one of the best uh, pictures that i have ever seen of the post operative outcomes of conjunctival melanoma and sars cases and all our cases were ct3a to c that were globe invasion eyelid invasion and orbital and extension also and we had 100% local tumor control vision salvage eye salvage and life salvage as well so the previous studies that have been done have shown that they have used variable plaque that is like ruthenium strontium iodine we use a symmetrical ruthenium plaque in all the cases and uh, we also saw that there were no recurrences in our cases however they have been shown earlier in few of the cases probably because they were larger sample size as well and uh, we had a mean follow up outcome of 8.1 years where all the patients are doing extremely well and all have survived so that's uh, quite a success and the multimodal management is what we advocate that is excise the lesion with 4 mm clinically clear margins do a nice lamellar sclerectomy alcohol keratopathy must be done for the corneal component double freeze thaw cryotherapy should be done for the edge and the base and adjuvant plaque brachytherapy must be performed to make sure that there is no recurrence with confirmation of histopathology as well and this will lead to excellent local tumor control with vision salvage eye salvage and life salvage in all the cases we are still following up on the cases we haven't left them this was a study which was done last year so at the follow up of 9.1 years nearly we still have no recurrences and no metastasis in our cases thank you very much excellent talk uh, dr rolika so i uh, just one question uh, so you are placing plaque immediately after excision or you allow some you know time to heal uh, the surface also right ma'am so in the cases where we are very much sure about the orbital uh, the corneoscleral invasion we do intraoperative uh, immediate plaque brachytherapy we don't wait for the uh, healing process as you mentioned however in cases where there is doubtful in, uh, involvement of the base we wait for the uh, histopathology report but whenever the histopathology report comes as positive we plan the prechytherapy within a week only so we don't no, it's delay it's not about the histopathology it's about the healing no ma'am we don't so wait. there is no healing issue when you straight away go ahead with no. you know primary uh, plaque therapy after the excision in fact we have observed that uh, in the cases where the uh, excision was done elsewhere and we have received cases which are not a part of this study but we have actually felt that uh, the healing causes uh, uh, an increase in the depth also since the fibrosis occurs we are not able to achieve exact 2 mm depth so we have we, are, we always have fear of recurrence in those cases because we cannot reexcise that area and then put the plaque so in this we have already put the plaque and then we reconstruct the surface so it heals out very well so these are mostly partially excised cases no All the of these cases are all completely excised. Where you are giving uh, the brachytherapy, you don't know microscopically, no? Yes, ma'am. Microscopic involvement is what we rule out, and that is why we do the radiotherapy. And you have shown good series of cases, almost all varieties. So this is over how long uh, period? Like because melanoma yes. is hardly seen. Uh, yes. Uh, tumor, I must say. This is a ten-year study, ma'am. So this is over 10 years you saw these yeah. many because we hardly, I think, Dr. Seema must be seeing how many cases in a year. I mean, uveal melanoma is very common, yeah. but uh, conjunctival melanoma there are very few in number. Right, we don't see that many. I That's mean, why it's quite rare, and yeah. uh, we have seen so this is over ten years. years. Yeah. So, what are the what was the uh, histopathological type of in 
all the cases that you saw it was it epithelioid cell type yes ma'am there was a mixed variety epithelioid was also there there was all mixed variety ma'am okay. i just have one last question so do you do cryo to the basin or in cases where you're doing a sclerectomy uh, so partial in the cases where we do a partial sclerectomy we have to be very careful about cryo cryoing exactly at the base so when we are anticipating that we have cleared off the base completely this is of course a very clinical intra op decision that time we don't uh, we don't do cryo to the base when we when like we are very definite and sure that uh, we have taken off the uh, of course as you are right absolutely right, there is no way to identify whether we have cleared off the cells as uh, completely no, because, or not because uh, why i asked this question because anyways you are doing brachy and that's going to cover that area yeah, so yeah. there's really no need for cryotherapy you know because it's only going to increase the problem with healing and you know so yes. i was just wondering why the cryo if you're doing the brachytherapy this was in fact a question that was even discussed in iso ma'am like you know uh, there are people who in fact defer cryo completely they are we even uh, went through the studies which have covered cryotherapy initially mm -hmm. so they have said that uh, cryotherapy lands are causing inflammation post operatively but uh, in even in the ossn cases or even the conjunctival melanoma cases we do cryo we have not seen any post operative inflammation coming up in fact the surface looks pretty much smooth and it uh, heals out very well no, my oh uh, yeah okay that's good yeah <laughs> no you. i was wondering that uh, even if visibly uh, tumor is left uh, we are not, if suppose we don't uh, damage the integrity of the sclera mm -hmm. and even if, uh, visibly uh, you know tumor uh, tissue is left uh, after all we are for doing brachytherapy so right. why to uh, do you know partial sclerectomy unnecessarily and you know compromising the scleral integrity so what is the uh, need i'm not uh, getting that ma'am that's absolutely right what you're saying is that uh, as you saying that since we are doing brachytherapy then what's the point of doing a partial sclerectomy and yeah, what's the point of doing local, local. it's a localized high dose radiotherapy you know? uh, right and that also 10000 uh, centigrade as the apex yeah. dose it is that when we went through the literature as i mentioned even shields et al have mentioned that the possibility of the uh, cells being left over with cryotherapy cannot be unnoticed so their their query or the statement was it's better to do cryotherapy than to leave it so it's like a kind of outweighing the two whether we should do or we should not do for their statement itself is that if we do it then it's good enough if we don't do it we might be missing on some cells and if we get recurrences in these cases then it is uh, you know the kind of uh, life uh, risky to the life so that's fair it's kind of overdoing it yes it know. is thank you rolika for a very nice presentation and for very nicely answering your the queries rp center and the place where you are working truthfully they are places we look up to i don't deny that i have not done these brachy therapies and all and even today when i face a problem in my patient my phone goes directly to ma'am ki ma'am i've come across this patient and now you let me know what should i do so but still see uh, you let we are learning Definitely. and you also have been blessed i would say to have dr santosh navar sir as your mentor and now i'm sure sir is also must be feeling proud because you are equally providing him all the honor and i don't so know about that really <laughs> so nice thank you. thank you and with this we yeah please 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 right 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 so the one that you saw in the fornices right so in the cases where fornicial right in the cases where fornicial involvement is there uh, we go ahead with uh, the rotation but with the fornix lesion we cannot reach out with the plaque those lesions are dealt with cryo and they are not uh, they do not come back in that that's the patient who is a 16 year old boy who's doing really well but uh, he landed up having uh, those specks of lesions were then the fornix part but cryo is generally for pam areas no it's more effective rather than for infiltrative nodular lesion if yeah, infiltrative yeah. nodular lesion is there anywhere else it's better to you know excise it and do the cryo of the surrounding area in the base Gee. even if it is multicentric and you're not planning brachytherapy so we do that on the basis of size ma'am like if it's a very small size by 1 by 1 mm then we consider for cryo uh, cryo lesions the ones that uh, ma'am is talking about it's they better, were smaller I, i personally feel that it's better to excise pam areas with atp i understand that you should cryo right, the very flattish looking areas but once it is uh, reached that you know 
Uh, it's always better to excise and, and see yes, the involvement. It's become a nodular kind of thing. It's better right. to excise. Right now. That is what I. Are you are you absolutely right now? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sometimes you have a lot of areas of PAM with only a single area of melanoma. So. when you have multifocal areas many of them actually turn out to be pam with a focal area of uh, melanoma so and one of the pam is leading to uh, congenital yes. melanoma as we have yes pam with atypia okay with that i think we have over exceeded our time but uh, still even i feel even few of uh, our audience has gained something i would say the ic was ऑडियंसू थैंक यू टू माई ऑल स्पीकर